and we justify. And we justify these things uh, even when they become unhealthy. And I don't want you to hear any of these things as, as, as you struggle with this or you struggle with that. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not casting dispersions. And I'm not saying that most of the things that, that we'll talk about today or that I'll show, I'm not saying that those subjects are bad. I'm saying what we do with them determines whether or not they're an idol or not. And so that point, then, I'm saying is to never feel bad about it. My, 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 my drive is not to make you feel b- bad about something. My drive is to, to help you to understand and set you free. I picked some very obvious things, and we're going to talk about those because they're obvious because of the season we're in. But when I saw that setting, and I'll get into this a little further. It doesn't matter if it's a football field or a concert. When I saw those people that excited, there's, there's an event. There's an event, um, and I think it was in our bulletins this week. It's in two weeks. It's on the 15th. It's a Sunday night. And it's a worship event, and, and the Loudonville Church, our sister church, is, is hosting this one. And we're actually talking about kind of bringing some of our, our worship teams together to be able to do some more collaborative events and host them at these different locations. But they're doing a worship event, and they're trying to start this off. And, and wouldn't it be awesome to see people there excited about God in the same way that you'll see the excitement at a stadium. And at, there's, a, there's a little minute promo to that event that's going to be again in two weeks. And I'd like to play that real quick. It's illegal in 14 states for me to sing in public. But we went to an event uh, a month or so ago, and the young lady that you hear in the background, her name is Amy Banbury, and she's from the Loudonville area. And that's her. And when she was belting out some of these tunes, and it wasn't that you know, her voice was so much better than anybody else's voice, but it was uninhibited, 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 She was just excited to sing to the Lord. And I'm telling you what, the the passion that I heard had me belting it out, risking jail time. Okay? I I was putting it all on the line because she motivated me that much. But she's actually going to come here and and we're going to, she's going to assist and be a part of our our worship team next week. Uh, And then that worship event is the week after. Um. Now that we've set some of these ground rules, I've got something else to read to you. This is where it gets dicey. We are our own worst critics, and often we need to put ourselves in people's shoes, other people's shoes, to gain the proper perspective. And this, this thing that I, that, I, that I had read a while back and I wanted to read to you um, really spoke to me. And it was funny because we do have a visitor um, from another country, I think Montenegro, yes, and she's traveled just, just to check out our service, you know, all the way from Montenegro, I mean, we're, we're doing things here at CrossConnect, she's like, really, they have a new logo, awesome, um, 
but the, the theme here is, what if you weren't from here? What if you knew nothing about our culture and you came here and stayed with a family from Ashland, or, or Ashlabama, as I like to call it. If you came here and stayed and spent time with that family. Imagine for a moment that you live in another country, one completely foreign to this one, and you have the opportunity to spend this fall uh, a week in Ashland with a family. So you come to Sunday morning service and observe many people, many maybe even most people, slowly rising to make their way to a building they call church. They groggily approach that building for some sort of ceremony. Clearly, whatever happens at the beginning of that ceremony is not important because a good number of the people don't come until after it's started. I'm not looking at anybody. I'm just saying. I'm just putting it. It was already written here. I'm not judging you. Um, And so you watch them file in and, and... And they begin to mouth the words to songs, and many of them um, almost expressionless. Some of them even maybe emotionless. After which they passively sit down and listen to someone talk to them for a period of time. You notice people start to get a bit fidgety and uneasy as the time for this ceremony to end approaches. When it's finally over, they quickly walk out, but, but as you walk with them, you listen to them. And you hear, the, you hear many of them talking to one another about something that happened the previous day. They smile and they laugh as they recount another ceremony that they had been to. Apparently a bit more interesting than this one. You hear a variety of, of ceremonies that have happened. And, and they've happened on Friday night and, and Saturday and, and even on Sundays later in the day. And in fact, the rest of the week, that's almost all you hear them talking about the coming weekend's more exciting ceremonies. In fact, even the people that you were with at this church ceremony with are strangely silent about what they heard and what they sang. But they, they're very enthusiastic about these other coming ceremonies. They can't seem to get, those ceremonies can't seem to get here soon enough. So as your curiosity has peaked, you begin to eagerly anticipate these coming ceremonies with them. And when the time comes, you see people getting ready and leaving their houses uh, in some sort of outfits that they love to wear for these types of ceremonies. They're taking pride in these in dressing up for these ceremonies. Many of them drive far out of the city, some of them an hour and a half north, and others an hour or even up to three hours south. And they gather, they, they gather there in masses in what they call hallowed grounds for these ceremonies. They get there early for these ceremonies, way early, where they eat and drink and laugh and play, and not just with their friends, not just with their family, but with complete strangers. You've never seen community like this. And when the time comes, they all, tens of thousands, Well, they they start to enter the shrine together where they raise their voices with passion to applaud an assembly of children or adults, depending on which ceremony it is, uh, that they may not even know. And they're they're playing a game on a field. And as that game begins, they shout and they chant and they sing until they virtually lose their voices with far more passion than you witnessed on that Sunday morning ceremony. For sure, people don't look at their watches at this ceremony. They're so engulfed in what they're seeing and experiencing that they actually get excited when it goes into what they call overtime. Because going long like that is a sign of a really exciting ceremony. And the fun doesn't end after the ceremony ends. When the boys that that everyone has been cheering for win the game, the celebration has only begun. And the amazing thing is that it's not just the people that were there at that ceremony who are celebrating. You come to find out that back in, back in Ashland, thousands of other people who couldn't get to that ceremony tuned in on their televisions to watch that ceremony, even though some of these televisions were virtually uh, TV screens because they were actually designed to enjoy those ceremonies more. And Back at Ashland, scores of people have been huddled up in groups around these screens to be a part of these ceremonies at a distance. They, too, are in their homes, jumping up and 
and jumping up and down and high-fiving each other and celebrating the ceremony when it's over. And then, even on Saturday, late in the evening, almost as, as if there is nothing to be prepared for the next morning, they go to bed. And so the big question is, if you were that visitor from another country, and you came to this city on, on a week during the fall, and I want you to be honest, which would you identify as the religion that is most important and consumes and excites these people? We live in a land and a time where sports and, and other entertainment, it's not, we're not just beating up on sports here, war for our attention. They war for our attention, our affections and our devotions. Our time and our money, and not just high school, college, or pro football. That's, that's the easy, glaring example, particularly because we're in the fall. But whether it's football, golf, basketball, baseball, so- soccer, biking, swimming, gymnastics, cheerleading, hunting, or even my fitness or martial arts classes, any other of num- number of, of athletic activities or entertainments to which we devote so much of our lives and our families' lives to. Watching and playing and running all over the city and all over other cities across the state. To the churches of Ashland and everywhere else in this great country, and it is a great country, I say that we unfortunately are not too far removed from that city of Corinth. We in a land covered with church buildings and filled with professing Christians. We are tempted every single day, every single week, to commune with Christ on Sunday for an hour and 15 minutes, only to dine with idols every other day or the remaining 110 hours and 45 minutes that you would be awake under the normal person's schedule. As we go through these three weeks, and this is the only time I'm going to read that, I'm going to read a story, a parable of the Bible, and we're going to actually read through this all three of the weeks. And I think we're going to get really good at memorizing that because of it. But I want to stress, as I read this and everything grows silent, and for some reason people hate the pastor right now, it's kind of awkward, I want you to know that this is not saying that Our favorite pastime of football or any other of the activities listed are bad, evil, dangerous, whatever. I'm talking about the balance in our lives that can get unhealthy really quick. I'm talking about the priority and excitement that I can't make you feel for church, but at the same time, I got to tell you that if, if people are that excited about all these things and less excited here, I do feel sometimes like I've failed. God is the most important thing, being, whatever, in the universe and should command a little bit more excitement. I'm going to read Luke 14, 15 to 24. And again, I'm going to read it each week of of this series. And again, I think we're going to become experts on this parable. And if you're here for all three weeks, you'll know this simple story very well. And just listen to this story in some of the simple, it's got these simple, simple things to it, and it's also got these complex parts to it. And so I'm going to dive right in. I just wanted to make sure you know that I'm not, I repeat, I'm not downing football. I'm saying that it can consume you, though. All right, Luke 14, 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. 
Jesus, Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those he, that had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they, all alike, began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And still another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and he ordered his servant Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but still there is room. The master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you that not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Now, before we dissect the whole thing and to get to the heart of this parable, we need to look at another part of Scripture that kind of correlates that. And I'm going to actually pull from and find familiarity with Isaiah 65, 13 to 14. And Isaiah, and and, and by the way, the, the precursor to this verse of 13 and 14 God had called out. Uh, the Lord had called out, but the people didn't answer. God called, and, and he wanted us to come to the banquet. He prepared the feast for us. He is calling out, and many of us just aren't answering. And on Isaiah 13, 65, 13 and 14, it says, Therefore this is what the sovereign Lord says. My servants will eat, but you will go hungry. My servants will drink, but you will go thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. My servants will sing out of the joy of their hearts, but you will cry out from anguish of heart and wail in the brokenness of spirit. So what's going on here? What's going on here in Isaiah? What's going on here in Luke? The best of the best in the way of this feast is being prepared. This isn't suspect. This isn't some some buffet where you're wondering how long that's been there or if that's someone's pet that is now on a table. This This isn't questionable food. So what you need to know as a backdrop is here is the setup, and these are the things you need to know. You need to know that Luke 14, 16, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And have you ever gotten one of those save the date cards? Save the date. Have you ever gotten one of those save the date cards where someone has invited you to something and they're, they're hoping that you'll, you'll respond, you'll RSVP? And the idea is to mark your calendar so that you can prepare, prepare that date for this event so that you're not surprised or scrambling when that date shows up. But, but there are two invitations in this parable because that was what kind of happened then they sent out this this save the date um, but they also followed up with the servant going around and saying the date is here and so the first one is asking for this RSVP and for you to save the date and, and you've responded and you will and the second says it's go time and so the food has been, been prepared and all the arrangements have been made and just before the do- door opens The assistant walks in and said a significant amount of the people just texted and said they couldn't come. They had that right back then, right? It was just a different plan. Different plan. Can you hear me now? Um, And 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 but why? And, And this guy preparing this feast is saying, who would do such a thing? They said they were coming. And so there's this party, this giant bank banquet. The, the invitations went out. They told us they were coming. We prepared the food for them. Where did this derail? Why did those that were supposed to come bail? And were their reasons valid? And, and some of you may even be asking, what does this have to do with idols? 
And before I can answer that, we need to understand what an idol is. What's an idol? Are idols are idols big? Or some are, right? Well, can, can idols be gold? What if, what if idols were really small so that they were handy, so that we could take them around with us and worship anywhere we went? <laughs> Down in front. The definition of an idol is anything that takes the place of God in our lives. It really is that broad. And this is true if it's an actual thing, an object. This is true if it's a person. You know, we just announced our new youth leaders. We cannot idolize them. We need to make a promise, a pact. I know, I know Isaac was worried about that. It can be true if it's just an idea, a consuming thought, something else like that. And we'll discuss that part of it actually on the 18th. But an idol can be be something that when we have been invited to three, to, to numerous different events and banquets, and we said that we were going to go, this idol can be something that changes our mind and causes us to bail. That just fits. So maybe for us, maybe for us, we need to think about this in today's day and age. Because um, aside from the uh, um, what's what's the museum movie Night at the Museum, that was the only time we saw the Easter Head Island. But um, maybe for for us, maybe these idols look a little bit, bit different. So to, to ask the same three questions from earlier, is an idol something big? And I want a, a side note, side note, that's a big screen TV. And actually, they're making them now, but they actually wrap around you because we weren't immersed enough into this two-dimensional object. They're actually bringing it around you. <laughs> you need a bigger kitchen. Um, and, and I want a side note. I had a tough time finding a picture of a TV that didn't have a scantily clad woman on it which says something else about our culture. And I'm not sure who decided a girl in a dress made people wanted to buy a TV more. Like, like this, this woman is going you know, this, this, this to say, wow, you're so dreamy that you bought this thing that's going to have you sitting on the couch even more. <laughs> that's my guy. You know, but I found one that didn't have a woman in there. Well, what if, what if the idol is something gold? Huh, ladies? Huh? Huh? Do we have any idol worship here? Any any idol worship at all here? <laughs> what if it's something small? Now now this here is is that I think it's that Apple Watch thing, the Apple Watch. This is I mean it's a phone, it's all these things and and the lovely lady up front spoiling my thunder. Um Phones have gotten, I mean, the average phone, you don't have to just wear it as a watch. How many of you are without a phone right now? Two, three, four. Four. You're not, your salvation isn't in question because you have a cell phone. It's just an idea that these things become major parts of our lives. Can that be an idol? Absolutely. Can technology be an idol? Absolutely. And I suppose it depends on whether you're going Apple or Android, because if you love Jesus, you're going Android, I think. Is that what it is? So so the first idols that we're going to wrestle with today are those things, our stuff, our possession. Today isn't about football. That was just a fun way, at least for me, to start this. But today... We're going to talk about our things, our stuff, and our possessions. And it doesn't matter what it is, what the possession was, what it cost, how much you spent, how little you spent, and even if you got it for free. None of that matters. That's why the message title today is the best thing until the next thing. 
Because it doesn't matter what the thing is. It matters how we treat it. Whether it's my tools, my TV, my clothing, my watch, my tech stuff, my hunting stuff, my car, or my weight equipment. Let me ask you this. And, and, and think as broad as you want. Because for you, it could be books. It could be technology. It could be clothes. Yes, it could be clothes. It could be appliances for that big, nice new kitchen that you just conned Joe into. It could be something for your home. And, and in just a moment, I want you to really think about that one thing. And you're going to actually say it out loud. And if you're next to your spouse and you don't really want to, you're going to have to at least muffle it. But in a moment, I want you to say in this broad category, that possession or thing in your life that takes just a little bit too high a priority. And at the th- count of three, I want you to say it out loud. Are you ready? You're going to do this with me? Yes? One. Two, three, technology. I heard a lot of good ones out there, actually. Thank you. I heard time. That's a big one. That's a stealer. Time can be an idol, can it? We're talking about these things, these ideas, these perceptions. Our selfishness with our time, our willy-nilliness with our time. And for, for those of you... That, that maybe just aren't tracking in this, and you're saying, you're saying that I don't struggle with this stuff. There's nothing that really d- diverts me from God. I've got it all figured out. Nothing has become an idol in my life. I just don't struggle. I heard something over there, Dino. You're, 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 you're like that, right? What is something that you would never let someone else borrow? Even if it did something good for the kingdom of God. What is something, and and we got honesty, right up front, honesty. What is that, and I don't expect you to say it out loud, but I'm going to hazard a guess that everyone here has that one thing that they're just not going to give up and let someone borrow. And maybe that is the concept of time. What is that one thing that, thing that you think about as yours instead of God's? And if some of us were fully honest, you might say, yeah, what do you mean some of this stuff? This, all this stuff is mine. I bought it. I paid for it. It's at my house. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. It's mine. And if that's true, maybe all of your stuff is idle. But we've started a 12-part 12 help, 12 uh, help program, so we, we got you covered. But in this next slide is that first excuse that we saw. is I have, bought, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. And in layman's terms, he's saying, let me go admire what I just bought. And... Can I first say what a lame excuse? How, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. First of all, you're not going to buy land without seeing it. I, if, and if that's not true, I do have some swamp land that I'd love to, love to offer you. But he says, I bought some land and I need to go see it. You haven't seen it? He wants to just admire his stuff. And for the broad pace of today's thing, we're going to call it stuff. And even if it's land, he wants to look at his stuff. And, and, and what it, it's really saying is, is that when you, when you can look at your stuff anytime you want, why am I looking at this now instead of going to this feast? If it's your stuff and you can see it anytime you want, why is it so important, so engulfing so obsessive that you have you can't be parted from that to go to this feast. 
Because like I said, you'd never buy a field without seeing it. And, and so these excuses, excuses are ordinary. They're common. They're everyday life scenarios. And really, I think in the parable, that's the point. Because whether we call it oxen or a car, they fit. And the audience that Jesus was speaking to would have been shocked and blown away that someone would make such a lame excuse after being invited to the banquet. And you can picture the audience, you know, turning to one, one another, tilting their noses in the air and saying, wow, I would never. And Jesus pauses and he waits for those words to sink in. And he allows for that moment to turn and become awkward before finishing the parable and point, pointing out that his audience, the people that are saying they would never, they're the people of this parable. Who would do such a thing? You would, I would, and we all have. The basic insight is that this is all too easy to get caught up in the things of life, which distract us from what matters most. There's a statistic, a uh, shopping s- statistic, that says 70% of the things that the average person buys when they go to the store on a weekly basis, 70% of those things are things that they did not go there to get. But underneath that statistic is an even far more shaping and massive lesson. In this parable, Jesus is talking about an invitation to a banquet. And not just a banquet, the banquet. And people have been RSVPing. And because those that, that were invited are told, hey, everything, everything is prepared, the food is ready, and the party is starting. And yet now, the people are too busy, too preoccupied, you know, with that day-to-day life stuff. And they say, no thanks. This is the equivalent of the host throwing open the doors and finding no one on the other side. And then he checks his phone to find out if anybody has sent a text and to, to, to see why they're not there and why it doesn't fit their calendar. And who would do such a thing? And, we already, and I didn't hear anybody say they wouldn't, but you did, I did, we all have. And when we do this, when God invites us, to the best thing ever. You see, we're going to take this back home. When God invites us to the best thing ever, and we say that we're in, we RSVP and say, sign me up. And then we say, well, hey, God, I'm sorry. I can't. I can't come because i, I got to stare at my stuff. That angers him. I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to say God hates that. This is when you are living yes, or I should say you are saying yes, but living no. Oh, God, I'm in. Oh, God, sorry, I can't. I really apologize. This other thing came up. The ordinary, everyday life doesn't have to get in the way of your faith. And I know that some believe it does. And I know it's hard for all of us. I'm going to put myself in that category. But hanging out and looking at our stuff should never get in the way of what is important and what is the most important. And that ordinary, everyday stuff shouldn't get in the way of our faith. Or the context in which we are to live our faith. Not just babble about our faith. Live our faith all day, every day. And if we're not careful, we let these unimportant things become idols. Here's what you need to know. You have spent your day, your day-to-day in self. In self-service, and our concerns about what we want and what we want to accumulate. And in this parable, Jesus, he cuts to the core. Because at the beginning, Jesus was talking about choosing the lowest seat and dying to the self. 
And, this, and the response was, at the very beginning, people were saying, they were texting in, blessed are those who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. In other words, the idea was, yes, we want to eat. We want to be a part of this because we're awesome. And that guy and, and the people in the room that have totally missed the point of this parable that Jesus is clearly trying to make, and that is that there are tons of spaces left at that table. There is more than ample room in our Father's house. And there's room at the banquet. And our concerns, our drive, our purpose is to, to, to A, recognize that God has given us this invitation that none of us deserve. No one in here deserves an invitation like this. None of us. Yet God has given it to us all. We've had these conversations. We just had a nice one in Sunday school. God is inviting all of them to the table. He wants to leave the baggage at the door, but he's inviting you to the table. And B, the concerns in life that don't have eternal value, those things don't matter. But our job as servants of God is to go out and invite everyone there. Starting with the lesser than. Starting with the least of these. Starting with those people that are even more broken than we, if we can imagine. Starting with those who have been looked down on. And the saddest part, the saddest part is that not only do none of us deserve to go to this banquet, and God has invited us, and the saddest part is the truth is we allow this cheap crap to distract us from God, to give us an excuse not to go to his table. And that those things of life to excuse us from participation in the kingdom of God. I don't care how expensive the stuff is, how nice your house is, how cool your car is, or how fun your fishing boat is. I don't care how amazing your possessions are. Those things are cheap trinkets to God. And they're definitely cheap trinkets compared to God, yet we get excited about all these other things. And that excitement's fine, but where is it in relation to your walk with Christ? If you were void of emotion and you couldn't have it here, I would not be able to expect it here. But when you have those things in your life that you can jump up and down, joyful of, what? He's got on that list. And if he's not, let's have a deep conversation, a truthful conversation, a heart-to-heart conversation, a person-to-person, a broken person-to-broken person conversation. And let's get to the root of this. And so we do these things over and over and over again. And I'm sorry, God, I have so many things to do. You know, there's stuff to look at. So God says in this parable, so these people don't want to come. No problem. Go get everyone else. Anyone else. And so he went and he got all the, the, the least of these. And it's still not full. And he says, keep going, keep fur- going further out, keep bringing people in. And then sometimes, because we're so busy, we bristle at this thought. Because how could they take our place? Because God, you, you, know, you know the love I have for you. You know the love that's in my heart. You know I say it often when I'm in church. But, but I get busy. I know sometimes things get out of whack in my life um, and I elevate some things too high. But God, I love you. I really do. So how can they take my place? And then here, here, here is what I think he, he says to that. To those of us who live that way. I'm just as guilty. He says to those that that are saying that they're coming, but then make these, again, ridiculous, stupid excuses because we are going and just looking at our stuff instead of coming and participating 
in what God has for us, and we do this over and over and over and over again, and he, and he here's that last verse, I tell you that not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. And now depending on who you are, this may land for you differently. This may sound good or bad for you. If you're one of the people that, that, that felt that you were way out, that felt like that you weren't on the first invite list, that didn't feel like you necessarily uh, had a place at God's table, you may hear this and say, awesome, I'm getting my invite. He's sending me out. He's saying everyone's invited. And it's probably great news because God says everyone can come and there is plenty of room. But if you're the person who's always felt like you deserve it and you've worked hard for Jesus and you're on the inside track, <clears throat> not to be confused with the inner circle, uh, inside uh, tech joke, um, and yet you're always too busy to actually do anything for him and to live, live that Christian life, then this might be a harder thing for you to hear because this isn't about what we say or even how we prayed. This is about how we live, how we live our life. And sometimes we hear things like this that, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying it, it's in the Bible. And sometimes we hear, well, God, how can you do this to me? God isn't doing this to you. God isn't doing this to us. In a meeting I had a month ago, uh, I, read, I read an excerpt from Robert Capone's book, The Mystery of Christ. It was actually a really good book. And I broke this quote into these, these couple slides. It says, heaven is populated entirely by forgiven sinners, not spiritual, moral aces. And hell is populated entirely by forgiven sinners. Did you, did you catch that correlation? That, that heaven is populated by forgiven sinners and, and hell is populated by forgiven sinners. The only difference between the two groups is that those in heaven accept their forgiveness and those in hell reject it. This couldn't be more relevant to you and I today. In this fast-moving, go, 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 go world that we live in, Jesus' ministry, ministry was, was centered around an announcement and an invitation to the kingdom of God. Among us, here and now, bursting forth in our day-to-day -day lives. Not just for someday after, and I think I touched on this a couple weeks ago, not just for, for, for that eternal time, but for that here and now. Not just for after we die, but right here, right now. So this is the key, because a lot of people think that God up there, uh, and they think of it as this eternal life in heaven somewhere else after we die. This is an invitation that goes out, and people raise their hand and say a prayer saying, Sure, I believe that stuff, so I can go there after I die. But the Scripture speaks of God's restoring, renewing, and reconciling of all things through His Son, Jesus, which is already underway. And we are invited to say, awesome, I'm in. And then partner with God in living this out. <clears throat> I need some water. Um, intermission. So, we can say, yes, I'm in, and we can partner with God, and that truth is right here and right now in, in, in every single day. I'm going to have to keep that for just a little bit longer, and every single day of my life, and it's, it's just too easy to make our faith about doctrines, 
It's just too easy to make these statements of belief. It's too easy to agree and defend with those arguments. But the original invitation from Jesus is follow me. Follow me. He didn't say, I'm going to quiz you on everything I say. He didn't expect you to be a Bible scholar and to memorize every memory verse and every line. He didn't expect you to figure it all out. He asked one thing. Follow me. Come, live your life differently. And yes, we believe and we trust that He is the way, the truth, and the life. But that includes following Him in our day-to-day life. The theme here at this church that I hope to be able to push out and I hope everyone else backs me up on is that action word. Faith is not just a descriptive. Faith is not a blank uh, set it next to your name. Faith needs to be an action word. I don't expect you to take a chair and set it up on the sidewalk and preach from it. There are other ways to be active in our faith. Christianity, um, actually, I I bought a book and it was collecting dust and my wife was making fun of me for doing it. Uh, I bought this book and I didn't read it for like two years and it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And I finally started reading it and I actually got some things from it. Um, Christianity can never merely be an intellectual theory, doctrine divorced from life or mystical emotion, but it always must be responsible, obedient action, the discipleship of Christ in every situation of concrete, everyday life, personal and public. And so I'm asking you to wake up. Wake up right now and don't miss this invitation. And when you give your yes when you give your yes RSVP, this, this should mean that we are reorientating our lives. A lot of people who call themselves Christians find the calendar too full to actually follow Jesus. It's just not convenient. And God is inviting us to the banquet, the greatest party, not because we deserve it, but because, because His way is grace. Because God is loves us, and wants us with Him. God has a massive house, and He wants us to fill it. So I'm asking, have you said yes? Have you made your RSVP? What's just one step, one step that you could take today to reorientate your life? Just one step, baby steps. What's one step you could take today to reorientate your life so that it reflects a rehearsal For that day. How does the stuff that you have today help or hurt? And can we confess that there are way too many things in our lives that captivate us?